So we committed that we will have introspection session. Not session, but the whole session will be containing introspection so that we learn how to apply Bhagavad Gita in our all actions. I think that we will deeply enter from next day onward. Today, perhaps the whole time may go in introducing the subject. I will chant some invocatory verses and then start. <coughs> Namo Namaste Gurave Mahatmane Vimukta Sangaya Saduttamaya Nityadvayananda Rasasvarupine Bhumne Sadapardayam Buddhamne Namaste Namaste Vibho Vishwamurte Namaste Namaste Chidananda Murte Namaste Namaste Tapo Yoga Gamya Namaste Namaste Shruti Jnana Gamya Namaste Namaste Tapo Yoga Gamya Namaste Namaste Shruti Jnana Gamya Swarajya Samrajya Bibhuti Resha Bhavat Kripa Shri Mahima Prasadat Prapta Maya Shri Gurave Mahatmani Namo Namaste Stu Punar Namo Stu Namo Namaste Stu Punar Namo Stu Namo Namaste Stu Punar Namo Stu Namastas Main Sadaikas Main Kasmai Jin Mahase Namaha Yadetat Vishwarupena Rajati Guru Rajati Yadetat Vishwarupena Rajati Guru Rajati Hari Om Tatsat Jai Guru I think it is better to chant one Shanti Mantra that is a Kathopanishad Shanti Mantra which um, which emphasizes the study of Shastras with the teacher Sahana Bhavatu so you, I will chant half up and then you can repeat. The chanting should be such that it completely withdraws your mind from all the fragmented worldly things and make it convergent. Then only we will have the benefit of the studies. Om Om Sahana Vavatu Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bhunatu Sahana Bhunatu 
ಭಕ್ತಿ ಸಹ ವೀರ್ ಕರವಾವಹೈ ಸಹ ವೀರ್ ಕರವಾವಹೈ ತೇಜಸ್ವಿನಾವಧೀತಮಸ್ತು ತೇಜಸ್ವಿನಾವಧೀತಮಸ್ತು ಮಾ ವಿದ್ವಿಷಾವಹೈ ಮಾ ವಿದ್ವಿಷಾವಹೈ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 I think you have chanted very well, better than me even. That it is, uh, solo chanting is simple, I am chanting in my own way. But having a chorus chanting like this all together, it's not easy. It is quite difficult also. I am feeling very happy about it that you have been able to. I think it is the result of our uh, global satsang perhaps. No? You have all <laughs> learned the tune. Now, I will straight away come to the topic. Although most of it you may know, but I would like to summarize certain points. For example, whatever yesterday I spoke during the introduction session, this uh, Shanti Mantra re-emphasizes that. Sahana Vabhutu means, may we both be protected. Now, normally we always think protection means physical protection, protected from various uh, accidents or so. But in Upanishadik Shanti Mantra, that protection is very minor. The greater protection is our intelligence, the purity of our mind and the sharpness of our intelligence should be protected. Raksha, sahanau, sahanau avatu, avatu means rakshatu, means you protect. But the spiritual raksha, spiritual protection is not physical so much. Physical protected, physically protected most of us are. But where we lose is that we don't have the sattvika qualities of the mind, the sattvika qualities of the intelligence. They are not we are not able to retain. So when we are praying that may we be protected, it actually means, we means the disciple as well as the teacher. The teacher, because of his intelligence, mind, emotions, everything being protected in the sattvic, quali- uh, sattvic qualities of them being protected, he should be able to communicate the truth in its proper manner, powerful manner. That is very important. Unless the teacher is able to communicate the truth in its true form, in its proper manner and powerful manner, where from he will get the power? The power comes from his life. Whenever he is living a sattvika life, the power enhances. The truth always gets expressed through the words. So protection to the teacher means the teacher must have enough of sattvika qualities so that when he communicates it it is communicated with great power and purity and propriety. That is very important. Similarly the protection for the seekers it means that we should be able to absorb what the teacher is saying. That again means how, what amount of sattvika qualities we have been able to absorb in our mind, emotion and intelligence. That is the real protection we are meaning. So, may both of us be protected means actually, may the teacher can communicate powerfully and properly because of his purity and sattvika qualities and may the seekers also be protected by their sattvika qualities to absorb 
the knowledge which has been given by the teacher not only absorb absorb and retain yesterday as we said that receptivity and retentivity retentivity see receptivity is what we understand through the intelligence that is called the receptivity if the intelligence is humble we will be able to understand more or less may not be fully but to some extent but the retentivity is depending on our own life the teacher cannot supply it dhriti the retentivity it depends on what kind of life we are living are we leading a satvik life where all this knowledge will be easily retained if we are not then the knowledge will just leak it will just fall off it will not be able to retain its power even theoretically we may remember and we may give lecture also but it will not have the power the power comes from within it is not in the words fully the same words can be spoken by so many people if or the same person at different times how much of power and conviction it will carry will depend on what kind of the what kind of a mindset the person has what kind of an intelligence that is the sattvika qualities sahanau avatu sahanau bhunaktu may we be nourished may we means the teacher and the student be nourished well now what is the nourishment we are talking about we are not talking about nourishment means you take a lot of materials and fill your stomach and run very fast or do quite a lot of work no that we don't need for studying of scriptures or to deliberate about the truth truth again that is the nourishment is a sattvic nourishment that we should have the nourishment to our mind and intelligence so that we have the receptivity and retentivity sufficient sattvic nourishment should be given to our mind and intelligence how for the body we need sattvic food that is the physical nourishment definitely we need it without that the mind will not be the mind is also made of the subtle elements of the food so food has to be sattvic that food means i am talking about material food then for the mind what is the food thoughts are the food for the mind so to have nourishment for the mind means we have to always read noble things noble thoughts should be put into our mind we should see whatever we see the noble things good thoughts should be always brought to our mind we should read such things we should listen to such things which will make our mind pure and powerful for the intelligence what is the food intelligence is basically the vichara the analysis so what we are doing here the discrimination about truth and untruth and all they are the sattvika food for the intelligence so may we be nourished means we should be nourished physically by the sattvika food material food mentally by the food for the mind that is the mental food thoughts and all and food for the intelligence which are the analysis and whatever we are deliberating on we are always deliberating on so many things finding out fault in others so they are also intelligence is working we are analyzing somebody's behavior and also coming to a conclusion that no his mind was thinking in this manner he, he covered up and showed this and all so that we are criticizing another person instead of that we should criticize us that this deliberation is not a sattvic deliberation it is only analyzing others let me understand that what kind of deliberation will make our mind enlightened and subtle and sattvic sahano bhunaktu sah viryam karva vahai whatever we do may we do with full application courage virya means courage now the real courage comes from within our upanishads also says that atmana vindate viryam it is not the power of money power of um, lokavala that is political power or fame power or money power or property power no the 
virya, the real virya, it comes from within. That whatever we are speaking, whatever we are learning, if we live that, then the learning will become powerful. Say, we are saying that satyam vada, we should be truthful. Now, we have to analyze in our behavior where all we are not becoming truthful. As we change our behavior by analyzing the behavior and making it truthful, the power in our word increases. Then when we say it will be more powerful. Similarly, whatever we are studying, if we live that knowledge, suppose we are studying always about the universality of the Atma, the one Atma, and that is what we are studying always, we don't have many topics in spirituality, only the Self, which is one, and all-pervading, not all-pervading even, which is not in the objective field, the whole objective field is in the Self, all these things are there. Whatever the minimum thing is, we are talking about unity and samya, that evenness. But in our behavior, are we behaving like that? We are too much prefer, we have preferences and prejudices. Some people, when we see, we feel so glad and we start gossiping also, other than important work. And some people, by seeing, we feel we, our mind becomes... Uh, depressed, our face becomes long, Are that man has come again. So we have that, always we are having this preference and prejudice, Raga Dvesha, which Bhagavad Gita says, Raga Dvesha. So, we are not living the knowledge. The knowledge which is talking always about unity and diversity. We are not living that, we are creating more diversity in the diversity by our preference, prejudice and all. So, Sahaviriyam Karabhavahi, it's a great statement. We should try to understand it very well. The more we live the truth, it becomes more and more powerful. Whatever we do, we should do it with the full virya, full courage. And courage comes from within. That is why you will find that a saint, generally he is not afraid of police or dacoit or anything. Then Swamiji other day was talking about Valmiki, when he met the Saptarshi. They were not afraid about the dacoit party attacking them or so. Where from they get that courage? The real courage always comes from the truth, from Atma. Sahaviryam Karavavahe. What is the next one? Uh, tejasvi nao adhitamastu. Tejasvi nao adhitamastu. Whatever we are studying, may it become tejasvi, become powerful. Again, who can it become powerful? By living the knowledge it will become powerful, otherwise it will remain only theoretical knowledge. One person in Jamshedpur used to speak very well on Vedanta. He would give lectures, he would be called also to give lectures here and there. But coming back home in the evening, he will create a hell. Beating around, uh, because he will come drunk and then beating around the wife and the daughters and one day he set fire to his own house also. So, but he was a very good speaker on Vedanta. So whatever we are studying, it has to be lived. Then only te, it will become tejasvi. Tejasvi now adhitamastu. Ma vidvishavahai. May not we have any intolerance or hatred towards each other. No dvesha bhava towards each other. I have explained it in great detail. I will not go today. Earlier in many places it is there. Now, Bhagavad Gita, all of you will know that what is the difference between Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishadic studies. See, Upanishads always, it presents the truth in a very direct manner. Just it will speak about the truth. It doesn't go into many rational explanation or anything at all. It simply and speaks about what? The ultimate truth. 
our real identity, the Atma, and the, which is same as the Brahman. It goes on speaking about that. But as such, to be fit to fit for the Upanishadic knowledge, it's extremely rare. Because otherwise we will know theoretically the Upanishadic knowledge, but without the purity and convergence in the mind, we will not be able to, it will not be useful for us. So Upanishads had remained away from the society for maybe many thousands of years. It was only restricted to the renunciates who has left the worldly pursuit, worldly life and only pursuing this knowledge. That is called Jnana Nishtha. That means exclusively devoted, dedicated to knowledge pursuit. They will only pursue the knowledge for food also. They will have some little from the forest or from the satra. You will find that in where many sannyasins are there, some satram will be there. Where they give some food, they will live on that. They will not spend time on food also. Now, does it mean that this knowledge is not applicable to the other people because they this fit for the exclusive jnana nishtha, exclusive knowledge pursuit are very few, very rare. Can the Upanishadic pursuit be the knowledge, this knowledge of truth be left only to them? This thought must have come when we do not know, at least to Veda Vyasa or Sri Krishna, that it should not be like that. Veda Vyasa has written Mahabharata where he has taken Sri Krishna as the role model who is giving the knowledge. So Veda Vyasa must be, it must be Veda Vyasa's opinion also that his mind is expressed through that. Whatever it is that they thought that it should not be restricted to only to the renunciates. It should be available to anybody working anywhere in any field of life. Anybody working in any field of life anywhere. Even you can say any phase of life. If it is taken right from childhood, it is still better. It's not that no, uh, now you remain with the other things, after retirement you take to the knowledge. It doesn't work. So, <coughs> so in presentation of Bhagavad Gita, we find that it is amazing that such a book on analysis of the personality, analysis of the problem, of human personality and the solution to that, it has been presented with such threadbare discussion and such clarity and profundity. It is unimaginable. Although you can say Yoga Vasishtha Ramayana also was meant for people living in the world. Yoga Vasishtha Ramayana, it is as far as we know, it was Basically, it came up in Kashmir and the, the name was Mokshobhaya. There was a book close to Yoga Vasishta from which Yoga Vasishta appeared. And in Kashmir spirituality, we find that this is very common, that spirituality has been applied to the worldly life so that the life becomes divinized. It is not that for divinity you leave the world and go away, leave the world and go away, but make the worldly life divine. This was there in Yoga Vasishta also, but Yoga Vasishta is a much later composition as far as we know. Bhagavad Gita is much earlier. And Yoga Vasishta also, it does not have this kind of brief personality analysis. It's not there, which is there available in Bhagavad Gita. So, in reading such a book, we can read Bhagavad Gita every morning, we are reading, chanting and sometimes this shloka, sometimes that shloka. But given the value of the book, the status of the book, 
unless we take it as a research and go deep into it, we will not honor the book, we will not give the value of the book as it commands. Because if you read it properly with depth and comprehensiveness, you will find that there are some very good presentation of certain problems and their solutions, which is not there anywhere else. Well, if you practice the Upanishadic knowledge, you will automatically be free of the problems because it is only you are meditating and completely getting immersed in the in the knowledge of the Atma. So, such a person, the mind will automatically become expansive and free of all dross, it will become purified. So, all the qualities that we are looking for from spirituality will be had. But the problem is right in the beginning, very few people are fit for practicing that knowledge. So, it will not be applicable to others. Whereas, Bhagavad Gita is meant for everybody. In any field of activity, in any phase of life, one can take to this pursuit and make their life better and better, purer and purer and ultimately attain the ultimate goal of the Upanishadic pursuit also. There lies the greatness of Bhagavad Gita. Now, if we analyze Bhagavad Gita, then we find some fundamental truths there. Can you show the first slide? Huh. I am trying to put it in this manner. Quite a few times we have done this way or that way. I think it will help. Humans are the fundamental problem of life. This is Bhagavad Gita's one prominent discovery. Bhagavad Gita has many discoveries. So this is one discovery that what is the fundamental problem of life? So. Humans are born with insufficiency. We are we, humans, we need not say in third person, we are born with insufficiency. In Sanskrit, we call it Abhava Bodha or Apurnata. Purna means one is full, there is nothing more to be had. So, the goal of spirituality is Purnata, Purnamada, Purnamidam, that Atma is Purna. So, Atma doesn't have to do anything, Atma doesn't wait for anything at all. So, Apurnata means we want something more to fill us. So, it is in English we are writing as insufficiency. That is why we crave for happiness. Now, what is the introspection? We have to think about it. That did I suffer from this insufficiency? You analyze and find out. You can write down also when you go back. You can write down the introspection. What is that? Right from birth, whenever we are... Suppose I, when we were born, the demand was very little. Maybe some hunger or basically it was hunger. Whenever we were feeling hungry, we needed food. Then feeling hunger is not really a desire, it's a need. But as we do it, we get caught by that and many things we get, we start clinging to that. So in, when we were small child, initially we were clinging to maybe some food, then as we grew up, we started clinging to some games, play and winning over the friends that who, who will be winning and who will be losing. Then as we grew up further, maybe it became a career that we think that by having a good marks or having a good rank in the exam, we will become happy. Is it not so? Every time in the baby, when he was looking for food and when he gets the food, he becomes happy. He is looking for the food to become happy. When he was playing a little older child, he was looking for playing all the time to become happy. He did not know if I play and don't study what is going to happen later. It will not be a happy life definitely. But at that time, that was his model of happiness. As we grew, grew up further, maybe we became 
interested in studies and having good rank and we thought that if I can have first rank then I will become happy. As we grow, grow up further, that also changed. Maybe we thought that getting a partner I will become happy. But after getting the partner about whom we thought that I will become happy, what happens? Are we always happy? After that also maybe we were, we think that if I have a good child I will become happy but the child doesn't listen to us. So even if the child is a brilliant child, he doesn't like the parents so we are not happy. Then we may think that grandchild. So what are we finding here that stage by stage the object of desire is changing. That which will make us happy that the craving for becoming happy, what will make us happy that goes on changing. As we approach, as we change in life, it always changes. Even over the day also you find at different times of the day, different things will be necessary to make you happy. Now I would like you to think about it that you think back and from your life you find out that what I thought will make me happy, did it make me happy finally? If at all, it should be an experimental record, you should write down. How maybe I got a very good job and before I got that job, I thought that I will become happy. Now, maybe when I got the job, I became happy also, but did it last long? Maybe I started fighting with the boss or did not like the boss because it's a higher post, the responsibilities are more. In it, any it, person to person it will differ. So what we have to inspect is that from childhood we are looking for something which will make me happy. But how it has been deluding us that really I have never become happy and that unfulfillment or insufficiency is still there. Otherwise you would not have come here. You have come here also thinking that my some knowledge, enlightenment I will get which will make me happy. The insufficiency will go. When the insufficiency goes, then you don't need anything. Whatever comes you do. This is what in Bhagavad Gita he said that Yam labdhva chaparam labham manyate na adhikam tataha yasmin sthito na dukhe na guru na api vichalyate About this attainment, spiritual attainment, he says that by gaining which we will not look for anything else. And by remaining where even the severest of suffering also will not be able to destabilize us. You see the, the condition of fulfillment. Even if the, in the Shastra it is said that even if the whole ocean one day becomes dry, the knower will not, it will not affect the knower at all. He is not bothered by it. So much is the confidence in the invisible element in us as Swamiji was expressing yesterday. That that becomes the reality. For us the objective life with the object body and everything is real for us. And the Atma is hardly real because we don't think about it when somebody forces us to think or we read some book, we think about it. But it is not a reality for us. Whereas for a seeker, more and more he advances this spiritual truth, the divinity, the Atma, that will become more real than the objective things around and all the objective pursuits. So, we are born with this Abhava Bodha and Apur or Apurnata. That is why we crave for happiness. And what happens? Do we get happiness? Generally not. I will come to that. The born with number one is insufficiency and number two is delusion. Moha. What is the delusion? We think something from the world will make us happy, will remove the insufficiency. You have to think well. Why are we calling it a delusion? 
because we thought that this will make me happy but when we found the desireful thing was obtained did it make us happy it did not so is it not a delusion that all along we have been thinking that it will make me happy that that something else will make me happy something else but so many decades have passed i have not become happy the problem comes here and bhagavad gita will give us the solution also we think that something from the world will make us happy that is something other than me that identity atma something other than that will make me happy so let us analyze whether it is at all possible or not suppose those who have done some meditation and have been able to get some result a very peaceful blissful state in that state what was there in the mind at least the world was not there is it not when the worldly varieties and all have all got dissolved then only the mind becomes peaceful you need not go for meditation in the samaji was talking about sushupti the deep sleep there also the same thing is happening unless we have a period of deep sleep in the night we will not be able to work properly the next day we become so depleted of our energy now in the deep sleep level did we have anything of the world we even forgot our own body mind personality the world was forgotten and the world which contains our body mind personality that was also forgotten so when the whole world is forgotten we have a very peaceful blissful state there so does it not contradict that something from the world will make us happy it means that when we are left to ourselves then we are happy that is we our atma that is the source our inside that is the source of happiness and if we can remain there if we are aware of that if we are in the awareness of that then happiness is our birthright actually it is a property a coordinate a na- it is a natural spontaneous property of our atma happiness we don't have to get it from anywhere else now bhagavad gita bhagavad gita builds this truth in step by step manner in various ways whichever will one way will attract one person another will attract another person all options are given <coughs> now the discovery of bhagavad gita is that we act motivated motivated by this desire to become happy and fulfilled that why we are acting anything that we are doing from whatever discussions i had you can think more about it but is it not does it not mean that we are always acting motivated by the desire to become happy that is why people generally say that swami ji without desire what can be the motivation that means desire to become happy that is the motivation for our work now this is the first discovery of bhagavad gita that we act to become happy but in the process we get more and more bound why because the happiness we are looking for it is not produced by what we are doing even if it is produced suppose i want a car and i try for it and i get a car so the desire is fulfilled but the moment the desire is fulfilled something else occupies our mind and makes us unhappy so the trouble is with the mind as long as it is looking for something different from the identity the inmost self the happiness is only short lived and it is becoming turning into either suffering or unhappiness or something else so the all our activities we are doing to become happy but because of our preference and prejudice our favored our likes and dislikes most of the time we are ending up becoming unhappy 
and that is causing the bondage what is why bondage we think that oh this much is the further money if i get then i will become happy so you get for further money but in the process you are bringing in more and more agitation to your mind whatever you are trying because you are not contented and it is like fire it is increasing more ghee you pour it enhances further and you become more and more more and more disturbed agitated by that <coughs> so the first discovery is this that we are born with insufficiency and delusion <coughs> and because of the delusion because of insufficiency we look for happiness and because of the delusion we think that something other than me something from the world will fulfill me will make me happy which doesn't happen second thing bhagavad gita says that next next slide it is in fifth chapter 15th verse i am giving only the second line ajnanena avritam jnanam tena muhyanti jantava see these are all cardinal statements of bhagavad gita muhyanti means deluded why people are deluded he says ajnanena avritam jnanam that is there is some ignorance which is not allowing us to know our true identity jnana the knowledge of the self or the knowledge of our true identity that is covered by ignorance and that is why we are deluded how can you say like that because the real i as we have been discussing always but we can again think about it and recapitulate the real i is not in the objective at all not to be found anywhere in the world it is our real identity in which the whole world is appearing to be the whole world which contains our body mind personality also it is appearing in the consciousness in the atma that is our true identity so our real identity is universal it is not fragmented by your body mind personality that my atma is different from your atma is different from his atma it is not like that atma is only one all pervading in which the whole world picture is playing now if this is the knowledge this is the knowledge of our true identity the moment we have the knowledge all problems are gone because the whole universe is in you what more do you want there is no lack no insufficiency you don't have to gain anything from anywhere so whole problem is coming from not knowing our real identity this is the this is the upanishadic discovery but bhagavad gita has put it in a more functional manner in a practical manner so he says that just as it is not any lack in us all our atma is our real identity and everybody is having that treasure we should not think that i am smaller than shri krishna or i am not i am smaller than this saint or that it is not so in reality we are the same identity everywhere then why are we suffering because we don't know only when the ignorance is removed the knowledge of the true identity is become becomes radiant it becomes expressed and we don't have any problem at all then that is what upanishad does upanishadic study it directly lodges us in this real knowledge of our, knowledge of our real identity now here what happens through purity of the mind working through various processes through the activities we pursue what the bhagavad gita suggests and we also attain this what do we attain the ajnana is removed so the real identity becomes apparent before us it is like the cloud the sun is always there even now the sun is there it's not that the sun is not there but we are not able to see 
If the cloud is removed, then the sun becomes visible. So, have we created the sun? We have not done anything to the sun at all. We have only removed the cloud. Then the sun becomes visible. Like that, the cloud of ajnana and the cloud of ignorance, the cloud of various draws in our mind and intelligence. That is not allowing us to see the Atma. We don't have to produce the Atma or make something pure then. We have to purify the mind and intelligence, make it clear, then the Atma becomes visible. So, this is a very clear exposition of the whole pursuit. What do we have to do in Bhagavad Gita pursuit? We have to remove the Adhyana. We have to remove the ignorance. So, naturally, if we have to remove the ignorance, then we have to know where the ignorance is sitting, where it is hiding. Bhagavad Gita will clearly tell us that where it is hiding and also how it is to be removed. In the next verse, uh, the, show the next slide. Jnani natu tadajnanam yesham nashitam atmanaha Tesham Aditya Vajnanam Prakashati Tatparam. Those whose ignorance is destroyed by the knowledge of the self, for them that knowledge, like the sun, clearly reveals the Supreme. These two go together, this 5.15 and 5.16. This is the, in a nutshell, what Bhagavad Gita is trying to do. Now, in Upanishads, Anybody who studies the Upanishads, he will have a feeling that to attain the truth, we have to leave all our worldly things, we have to leave all our actions, we have to go to the forest or to a cave and practice the knowledge. Bhagavad Gita says that no, you don't have to leave the world, you don't have to leave any activity. but. Sri Krishna says, I am suggesting a change in your mindset that the activities which were producing bondage, that is why you were trying to leave the activity, is it not? In Upanishadic pursuit, because the worldly activities are producing bondage, you leave the world and go and do remain in only in studies and realizing study, meditation, samadhi and what not. Now here they are saying that Whatever activities you are pursuing, change that mindset so that the activity which was causing the bondage, though that activity itself will cause freedom for you. It's a great discovery of Bhagavad Gita that we are not asking anybody to leave any activity, but just to change the mindset so that the activities which are producing bondage will produce liberation. By leaving the activity you don't gain because then the mind's constrictions, limitations, draws, everything will remain. The activities are only allowing you to treat them and remove. Suppose when you are acting, you will find that your ego is coming and your selfishness is coming. Even here also you can notice your day by day. The selfishness is coming, ego is coming, blaming nature is coming up. So, if you are pursuing this goal, then all those things have to be purified. How? To have a mind which is looking for an universal goal, a non-selfish goal, an expansive goal. So, it is not that you have to change your activity. Suppose you are a player in a very good team, you have gone to the Olympic. Now what happens is that everybody, all player will, they will look for winning the game. Now if they don't win, they lose the game, then they become sad. This is the bondage caused by it. And if they win, they become elated, but next year they may lose. Again there will be a problem. But suppose he is practic practicing Bhagavad Gita, then what will he do? He will think that I will play my best whatever is possible not thinking anything, the result will automatically come. If you play well, then 
there is a more chance of winning the game even if you don't win somebody will have to win the other person may win so it will give you a very placid dis- disturbance free mind in playing as well as after the game also so it is only a change of mindset that the bhagavad gita is asking us to do and that change of mindset bhagavad gita has put in many ways the first one i will talk about is one is asakta the second is jajja that in the way of jajja so all those will come today it won't be possible the first thing he says is tasmad asakta sadatam karyam karma samachara then he is saying yajyarthat karmano anyatra lokoyam karma bandhana tadartham karma kaunteya mukta sangah samachara then he will present in the third way is the buddhi yoga these are all presentations of bhagavad gita to show us the way towards this emancipation to this final goal all are actually same it is everything is making our mind universal expanded and making it free of all desires small small desires and limitations but it is put in different manner through understanding and the basic presentation of bhagavad gita is the buddhi yoga it is called it is not really just a karma yoga but karma is done with anchorage in the yoga buddhi which is called buddhi yoga i will take it up now as today is will you be able to do some introspection about it whatever i said that writing down from because why are we knowing that nobody will become happy why it doesn't strike us because we have not done the introspection we know that money by getting more and more money nobody has become fulfilled it's very apparent in more than fulfillment they are more and more disturbed by getting any amount of political power or fame nobody has become fulfilled then all knowing all these things also still we are why are we running after these things by which we will not have fulfillment we know because we are still running after them because we have not introspected about that when we think more and more about all the parameters that this will not make me happy should we do this should we do that the more you do this bichara your mind will be released of the bondage automatically so the bichara is the fundamental point bichara means introspection i had been telling about a story which is from zen buddhism i think the the guru was going for a walk in the forest the walking satsang with lot of with many disciples they were walking through the forest <coughs> and they will ask various questions to the guru also but very soon what happens is that they forget about the guru they start gossiping amongst themselves that is what happens generally so what happened is that after walking for some time they found that the guru is not with them so then started looking at one another that what happened that means they were so negligent about the guru that they don't know the guru is missing then they started looking for him looking for him is not that that means quite some time has passed in their gossip that the guru is missing they went back started walking back then at a one point he, they heard the sound that uh, in hindi it will be chhod do chhod do chhod do leave me leave me leave me are it is our guru's voice then something must have happened some dacoits or somebody must have something must have happened where from it is coming so they uh, tracing that voice they reached deep inside the forest and they could see guru standing with the in along with a big tree so they thought that the dacoits must have tied him guru is holding the tree like this and shouting leave me leave me leave me they came near they could not find any rope or anything so looking at it finally they said but sir you are holding the tree nobody has tied you 
बट ही वुड नॉट लिसन ही वेंट ऑन शाउटिंग लीव मी लीव मी छोड़ दो छोड़ दो छोड़ दो देन फाइनली टू थ्री ऑफ दम ने सर सर हाउ कैन वी रिलीव यू मॉर बिकॉज यू आर ऑल यू ओनली आर आर होल्डिंग ऑन टू द ट्री नो बट यू हैज यू देन द गुरु सेट हैव यू अंडरस्टूड दैट I wanted you to understand only that that nothing is holding you. No way there is bondage. You are holding on to the world, worldliness, not the world, worldliness. So we will discuss more about the bondage and all. The time is up. Om Sahana Bhavatu. ओम सहना सहनो भुनक्त सहनो भुनक्त सह वीर करवाह सह वीर करवाह तेजस्वीनावधीतमस्तु तेजस्वीनावधीतमस्तु विषावह मिद्विषावह ओ शाति 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 ओ शाति 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 ओ शाति 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 शांति 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 हरि ओम